be here this morning. Amen. God has been good to us. Yes. He has kept us safe. Yes. We are still alive. Amen. Hopefully in our right minds. <laughs> and that's Amen. enough to give him some praise. Amen. Amen. The psalmist tells us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all he lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Knowing that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. Amen. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his cause with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. Amen. His mercy is everlasting. Amen. And his truth endureth to all generations. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. And beside him there is no other. The privilege is mine to be able to speak to us this morning. And I trust that for the next few minutes we'll stay together. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Loving Heavenly Father, it is with grateful hearts we come before your throne of grace once more. Not to invite you in because your presence is already with us. We ask that you'll open our minds as we open your words and give us understanding. May we learn something that will elicit from us a response. May it have a sanctifying effect on our characters. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will be drawn closer to you and we will be careful to give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Speak to me, through me, and for me. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When I think about the awesomeness of Jesus, I'm told that in chemistry, he turned water into wine. In biology, he was born without normal conception. In physics, he defied the laws of gravity when he ascended into heaven. In economics, he disproved the law of diminishing return <laughs> by feeding 5,000 men besides women and children. And usually in those settings, women usually outnumber men. So it could have been at least 50,000. Hmm. It was not American laws or Cuban bread. It was two tasty bits of fish and five small loaves equivalent to a little boy's lunch. And by the way, he did not need a little boy's lunch, but he used what we have. Amen. Mm -hmm. In medicine, he cured the sick and the blind without administering a single dose of drugs. In history, he said he's the beginning and the ending. He's the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Amen. Yeah. In government, he said he shall be called Wonderful Counsel and the Prince of Peace. In religion, he said no one comes to the Father except through him. Yeah. When I think about Jesus, he had no servants, yet they call him Master. Amen. He had no degree, yet they call him teacher. Hallelujah. He had no medicines, yet they call him healer. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he had no army, yet kings feared him. Hallelujah. He won the military battles, yet he conquered the world. Mm -hmm. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. Mm -hmm. He was laid in the borrowed grave, but yet he lives today. Amen. The awesomeness of Jesus. I'm saying to us, he's not just a rock in a weary land. He's not just a neurologist when we get a stroke. He's not just a physician when we are sick. He's not just a passenger when you're in a sinking boat. He's not just a dentist when you have a toothache. But I've discovered that he's Adam's redeemed. Amen. Amen. He's Abel's dignity. He's Noah's ark. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Isaac's hope. He's Jacob's victory. He's Joshua's courage. He's Moses' rock. 
He's Samson's strength. Yes. He's Elijah's sight. He's Isaiah, Prince of Peace. He's Jeremiah, Bones of Fire. He's Amos' justice. He's Hosea's love. He's Micah's mercy. Amen. Amen. He's David's music. He's Solomon's wisdom. Oh, he is the great I am. Hallelujah. That I am. When I think about the awesomeness of our God, now, for those of you who love titles, I've entitled the message, A Divine Encounter. <laughs> the story is told of two brothers, and they lived a very questionable life. They were very wicked. They did some dirty, nasty, terrible, debauched things in life. And all of a sudden, one of the brothers died. And the other brother said, uh, he wanted to have a grand funeral for his brother. So he was looking for a minister, a priest, who could conduct the funeral service in a, in a beautiful chapel. And uh, he finally found a minister, and um, he said to the minister, can you conduct uh, the service for my brother, the funeral service for my brother? And the minister said, you know, you boys are... Uh, and he said to the minister, I'll give you a large sum of money. And uh, under one condition, that you will call my brother a saint. And the minister thought about it for a few seconds and uh, he said, I guess I can do that. So the day came and sure enough, there was a, a massive crowd in the congregation. And the minister began to speak and uh, during his discourse, he said, uh, the individual lying in the coffin is a terrible, dirty individual. That's a very terrible, nasty thing, debauch, very criminal. But compared to his brother, <laughs> he was the same. <laughs> I guess uh, when you attend a funeral today, Everybody is the same, depending on who you compare yourself with. But I turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. And whenever I, I read this passage, uh, my soul goes searching for the Lord who is high and lifted up, the Lord who is sitting on his throne. The Lord whose presence filled the temple. And uh, whenever I read this passage, time and again I said to myself, what is it about this passage that demands our attention? You see, for one, the words are powerful. The picture is that of a great God, I say a great God, who is reaching down from his throne to touch someone who needs him. Mm -hmm. And here Isaiah. In this passage, Isaiah has a stunning vision of God and a look at himself, a look that he did not like. When I think about this passage, and here God himself had called him and commissioned him, I'm here to remind us that the same God who reached down and touched Isaiah is the same God who wants to reach down and touch every single one of us. You see, before you were born, God, looking down through the corridors of time, saw you on this day, in this place, listening to this message. So you are not here by chance. You are here by divine appointment. Yeah. You see, some people think that all the world, that the world revolves around them. And that all you need is love. But I want to remind us that love without Jesus is a misnomer. Mm -hmm. It's no love at all. When you look around the world, the church, even the church could do with some more love, amen? Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus said in John 17. Some say that the world needs, what the world needs most is to accept, is to tolerate, is to embrace those who are different from us. And those who live, those of 
us who live in this country uh, will understand that. Some say that the basic problems are confronting humanity is the problem of race. And they contend that if we could all just come to grips with the fact that we all come from the same common ancestry, Amen. that we all come from Mother Eve and Father Adam, it doesn't matter what shade, the color of our skin, that we are brothers and sisters, Amen. that we are all made of one blood. Amen. They say that we will we, we'll be more responsive to one another, we will be more sympathetic to one another, we will be more accepting of each other. And I know that as I look at the church and God's church and even the world, it can be a better place if we are more accepting of each other. Amen. But there is still another theory that some maintain that the basic problem confronting the world is neither the lack of love that we have for one another, nor is it a problem of race. They insist that the basic problem confronting the world is the problem of war. They say that we possess an innate, deep-seated hatred and rage for one another. We are born with this. They say that this hatred leads to war. And these people contend that if we could just beat our swords in the, in the plow shields and our spears in the pruning hooks, the nations would not fight against each other. Mm -hmm. And people contend, these people contend that we would not fight against each other and we would usher in an era of peace. Well, to my simple preachers, all these theories are good because they all possess an element of truth. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that the basic problem confronting humanity is not a love problem. It's not a race problem. It's not a conflict problem. It is a Jesus problem. Mm -hmm. Without Jesus, there is no peace. Yes. Without Jesus, there is no security. Without Jesus, there is no hope. Without Jesus, we are absolutely lost in our, we remain in our lostness, there is chaos and confusion without Christ. Amen. God seems to be the missing link yes. in the lives of many people. Amen. And I've always asked myself the question, without Jesus, where would I be? Amen. Without Jesus, what would I be doing right now? I, I, and I've come to the conclusion that it wouldn't be pretty. Without Jesus, where would you be? Have mercy. Without Christ, what would you be doing right now? Be dead. We all need to quicken our conscience by the holiness of God. We, know we need to feed our minds with the truth of God. We need to purge our imaginations with the beauty of God. We need to open our hearts to the love of God and devote our will to the purpose of God and I want you to know that when we do this, something happens in our lives. We have a divine encounter with God. Amen. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah possesses, exposes, a, he experiences a divine encounter. He became a person who was changed, who was renewed, who was transformed. And as I read this passage again in Isaiah chapter 6, it says, beginning from verse 1, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the host of the Lord moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, 
For I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lord, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. I want to deposit the idea in our mind. That when we have a divine encounter with God, like Isaiah, something ought to happen in our lives. Something ought to be changed. Like your battery. Thank Go to have a technician in church, amen. Amen. <laughs> you see, in this passage, the prophet Isaiah has a divine encounter. Yes. His word has caved in on him. His faith and his hope, his trust for restoration of his country was placed in the hand of a man. A king, a good king called Uzziah. And as I believe that under the leadership of King Uzziah, that the nation of Israel will once again rise to a place of national prominence, to a place of national distinction of national greatness. But the unforeseen happened. The unpredictable transpired. A catastrophic event happened, occurred in the nation of Israel. King Uzziah died. And the prophet Isaiah, instead of looking to God, became despondent. He became discouraged. The prophet Isaiah was left to pick up the pieces of his life and to go forward. You see, some of us here today know what it's like to sit in Isaiah's seat. We know what it's like to sit where Isaiah sat, to experience what Isaiah experienced. Maybe you remember that phone call that you received. And at the other end of, end of the line, you could, you could almost instinctively tell that is not good news. And nobody wants bad news, amen? amen. Remember that uh, when the employer said to you, this will be your last week on the job. Remember that divorce papers that were served to you. Because your wife and your husband don't want you anymore. Remember the car that was being repossessed. Remember that the house went on foreclosure. And you, you are sitting where Isaiah sat. Remember the, 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 the news that you received from a physician because he said to you he was baffled by your symptoms and you need to do some more tests. You are sitting where Isaiah sat and you have experienced what Isaiah experienced. But God had to remind Isaiah that Isaiah was a, was a king who had so power. But God is a king who is all-powerful. Yeah, yeah. God had to remind Isaiah that Uzziah had some knowledge. He had some wisdom. He had some insight. But God is a king who, who is all-knowing, who is all-wise. God had to remind Isaiah that King Uzziah could die. But God is a king who lives forever. 
God had to remind Isaiah that King Uzziah was put in a certain place at a designated time that God can be in all place at the same time. And ever so often God has to remind us that our need is not in a doctor's prescription, but our greatest need is in a God who sustains you and I. I say ever so often God has to remind us that our need is in Him and in Him alone. And the greatest news is that when Jesus said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. The fact is we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. Not in what our physical condition is in, but our greatest need is in what our spiritual condition is in. That, my friend, is our greatest need. Amen. Now I'm saying this to say this. Isaiah was not a backbencher in church. Isaiah was not a no-nonsense preacher. Isaiah wrote hundreds of years in advance, and he wrote in the past tense, because he was in a crowd. He was there in a crowd that walked the dusty roads of Jerusalem, the rocky places of Palestine. Isaiah wrote in the past tense. The Isaiah 7, 14 text, Isaiah was there. He says, A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah was there in the crowd. He saw the, the, the virgin book. He saw Jesus being taken. He saw Jesus in the judgment hall. Read Isaiah 53. He saw Jesus being questioned, being ridiculed, being beaten, being spit upon being beaten, taken from one judgment hall to another. He was there. He saw the crucifixion. He saw the resurrection. He saw the great getting of glory. Isaiah was not a no-nonsense preacher. Isaiah was a prophet of God. He was God's messenger. Yeah. But when he had a look at God, God spoke to him. He saw the holiness of God. He saw the divinity of God. And he looked at himself. Some of us take it for granted that because we, we, believe, we belong to God's Roman church, that we hold an office in the church, that we all right. But Isaiah was a prophet of the Almighty God. But something happened to him. He had a divine encounter with God. There are some things that we can blame on others. But there comes a time when the buck stops here. Amen. It doesn't matter where we started. Sometimes the train have come up the track. 